We'd like to uh, like to get started again. I uh, am often haunted by the notion of new economic thinking. What is that stuff called new economic thinking? And uh, I'm breathing a sigh of relief right now because the panel that we have assembled now are talking about something that is really quite uh, profound and innovative and new in my mind related to economic thinking. It also is a, uh, this notion of the interaction of desire, the interaction of, of, of preferences is what we might just say explosive for welfare economics. And the work that the literary critic uh, Rene Girard did that underpins this vision and this perspective is something that I had read about when I was working on a documentary film about scapegoats. It's a, actually an American baseball film called Catching Hell about how a couple of episodes, one in the World Series and another in the playoffs, happened in Boston and Chicago and how these individuals that were involved, Bill Buckner and a man named Steve Bartman, who was a fan, were scapegoated, and their lives were quite miserable. I mean, a baseball fan who interferes with a foul ball had to go into the equivalent of a witness protection program. So trying to understand the emotions and the power of that led me to start reading Rene Girard and his work on scapegoating. But more germane to today and, and these questions. I, first of all, I want to thank a gentleman that's sitting in the front, John Peng. Andrew Sheng and I were together at the uh, IMF meetings in Tokyo. We were sitting in a restaurant having a lovely discussion about Rene Girard, and he said, you've got to meet this friend of mine who'd gone to Stanford, knows Girard. Well, make a long story a little less long. John showed up at the restaurant later that day. He was in Tokyo. And he went to Stanford on behalf of INET and recruited a very large proportion of the panel. Uh, the other dimension in, in terms of my thinking is uh, Edward Fulbrook, the World Economic Association. You and I had corresponded, and you inspired me to read a book called Intersubjectivity and Economics that you put together. And uh, I think this is a very, very rich, imaginative, set of hypotheses. I think the uh, implications are not just, I mean, th this type of work explains why there is advertising. It explains why the system is not mechanical and it is human. And, and I think the uh, importance is beyond just this identification. When one thinks about the challenges that Victor Fung spoke of earlier, of environmental degradation, if, does, if there's a difference between needs and wants, if the wants are inspired by rivalry and jealousy and, the, and a kind of sense of leapfrog, in a planet that has five or seven or nine billion people, that kind of subjective dynamic can kill us all that what Victor spoke of is we may need to change our lifestyle and we may need to get these mimetic dynamics both understood and then under control in order to save the planet through economizing on, on resource utilization, refraining from what you might call compulsive consumption. At any rate, I'll turn it over to the moderator Jean-Pierre Dupoy from Stanford University, and he can introduce the other panelists. But uh, please, uh, Jean-Pierre, and, uh, and thank you all for being here. I think this is very exciting. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Johnson, first of all, for inviting us. So I'm Jean-Pierre Dupuis, and I'm happy to introduce this panel. There are five of us on this stage, plus the absent thinker whose thought is going to be our topic tonight, René Girard. 
Time is short, and I'm not going to repeat what you can read about us individually in the program. Four of us, Paul de Mouchel, raise your hand, uh, Marc Hansbach, <laughs> uh, André Orléans, and myself, have been working together for the last 30 years on many topics, mostly economics and the economy, with René Girard's theory of mimetic desire as a source of inspiration, which does not mean blindly applying it to our concerns of the moment. Edward Fulbrook, a British economist, was the one who discovered our work on the anthropological and philosophical foundations of economic theory and introduced us to the English-speaking world. He even christened us and referred to us as the French intersubjectivists. Well, French is slightly exaggerated here since Paul is Canadian and Mark is a US citizen. <laughs> but we all started working together in Paris in the framework of the Philosophical Research Group of the Ecole Polytechnique, the CREA, C-R-E-A, which I created in 1982. Edward Fulbrook is well known to many of you, I suppose, for the incredible work he's carrying out to help economic theory extirpate itself from what he dubs autistic economics. He has set up a number of worldwide institutions to that effect, the most encompassing one being the World Economics Association, which edits a number of journals. He has edited numerous collections, including the one that uh, Mr. Johnson just referred to, Intersubjectivity in Economics. I'd like to add that although British, he loves France and French culture, and is a specialist of French existentialism. The gang of four, as we like to call ourselves, are today scattered all over the world. Paul Dumouchel, a philosopher, teaches at Ritsumeikan University in Kyoto, Japan. Mark Ansbach, an anthropologist, is a member of the CREA, Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. André Orléans, an economist, carries out his research today in the framework of the Paris School of Economics at the Ecole Normale Supérieure and I, myself, a philosopher, teach at Stanford University. But the work we are going to present tonight takes place in the framework of a project sponsored by the Thiel Foundation. Peter Thiel, like our host tonight, Mr. George Soros, is a philosopher financier, or financier philosopher, as you wish, known for the role he played in the development of PayPal and Facebook, among many other investments. Thiel studied at Stanford with René Girard under the name, uh, sorry, um, and like many, he was very much influenced by his master's ideas, and he decided some seven years ago to found and fund a project dedicated to the critique and development of René Girard's theory under the name imitatio. Imitatio is the Latin word, of course, for imitation. It is within that project that the four of us have started setting up an economic forum dedicated to giving new foundations to economic theory in light of Girard's theory. So it is an immense pleasure and honor for us to have the opportunity to submit some of our ideas to this assembly and to the members of uh, INET. And we are very grateful again for that to Robert Johnson, its director, and George Soros, its founder. I will say very little at this stage about Girard himself and his ideas, since this is the topic of our entire panel. French-born, very early on in his life, he moved to the US, where he spent his whole career, and at Stanford in particular, the last 20 years, where he's still living. First a renowned student of literature, he turned to anthropology and philosophy after publishing his first book, Deceit, Desire, and a Novel. Many throughout the world consider that he has revolutionized the very foundations of the human sciences. A polymath, he managed to escape what is known in the literary departments of American universities as French theory. French theory, which is a notorious American invention, not French. 
and paradoxically, thanks to the fact that he has been living and working far from his native country, language, and culture. Mm -hmm. Indirectly, this panel is going to ask a question. When it comes to overhauling the very foundations of economic theory, are the economists, orthodox and heterodox alike, in the best position to fulfill that task? After hearing all of us, you'll be the judges. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce now, to ask, to ask Edward to come to the lecture. Uh, my interest in economic intersubjectivity uh, began with Veblen's instinct of emulation. And then, strangely, it developed through my work on the French philosophers Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, especially a section on desire in Sartre's Being and Nothingness, a section which René Girard explicitly drew upon when initially spelling out his approach to intersubjectivity, mimetic desire. My presentation focuses on that word, intersubjectivity, in the context of economics, past, present, and I hope the future. I began with a, an odd and what appears to be an, an irrelevant question. How did Isaac Newton go about building his theoretical mechanics? I don't know, but I can say with confidence that he did not do it in the following way. He did not say to himself as follows. Now over there is a science that is extraordinarily successful and whose practitioners command more respect than those of any other discipline. It has identified certain basic structures in its empirical realm, and to be able to describe and analyze them, it has invented a mathematics that is isomorphic to those real world structures. What I'm going to do is to make, as needed, simplifying assumptions so as to define elements and combinations of elements in my empirical realm that are isomorphic to the mathematics and basic structures of the extraordinarily successful science. The world will then perceive my new science as closely analogous to the revered one. Please note that what I have just described is upside down science. It is the math or formalism that determines what structures are going to be attributed to the real world rather than real world structures determining what mathematics, if any, are capable of describing them. Remember Newton's project of creating his mechanics was held up for some years while he, <laughs> unaware of Leibniz's creation, invented a mathematics that was isomorphic to the structures he was identifying in the real world. The history of modern economics could not be more different. In the late 19th century, upside down science came to rule economics and continues in the main to do so today. Jevons in, his modern, Jevons, in his preface to the theory of political economy, wrote, the theory of economy presents a close analogy to the science of statical mechanics, and laws of exchange are found to resemble the laws of equilibrium of a lever as determined by the principle of virtual velocities. Similar decorations are found in Wallace's elements of pure economics. With the passing of generations of economists, the belief that markets, through their systems of prices, tend toward a beneficent condition, formerly analogous to mechanical equilibrium, became economic central structural hypothesis, a conceptual box in which almost all mainline thinking takes place. Consider the case of Keynes, whose intellectual powers and integrity I admire above all other economists. What is most amazing about the general theory, after its genius, is what it fails to do. True, it introduced the idea that eco eco economic equilibrium is not always a desirable condition. Nonetheless, the theory is framed within the equilibrium conceptual straitjacket. 
Of course, there are places in the general theory, especially chapter 12, where Keynes steps outside his analytical framework, rather like someone stepping outdoors for a smoke and a chat, and where he drops informal observations about how markets really work. These include talk about conventions, mass psychology, newspaper beauty competitions, casinos, and animal spirits. These analogies, one of which refers to reflexive phenomena, have come to be much used, but in the same casual way that Keynes used them. They have not led to the, to the development of a non-equilibrium analytical framework for markets. Such a development requires a much more substantial conceptual basis. It is this need for conceptual fundamentals that makes George Soros's concept and theory of reflexivity so important. It makes a fundamental break with equilibrium economics. It identifies equilibrium as an exception to the general state of financial markets. It admits indeterminacy, non-animistic entities, and positive feedback. Most important, it did not come about through the procedures of upside-down science. Soros did not begin with an abstraction and then make assumptions regarding an empirical domain so that, hypothetically, the abstractions would pertain to it. Instead, it grew out of decades of real-world observations for which he then devised a conceptual framework. In other words, Soros used Newton's method rather than Jevons and Balraz. All this makes reflexivity in financial markets a key element in building post-equilibrium economics. It alone, however, is insufficient. The project also requires fundamental reconceptualization of consumer markets based on real-world observations. The neoclassical project required definitions of entities formally analogous to those of Newtonian physics. Subjects had to be declared atomic, their desires treated as fundamental data. Only if their preferences were autonomous could, could a prevailing tendency toward equilibrium be formally postulated. This need implicitly categorizes interactions between people or between a person and a socioeconomic structure, markets, for example, into two groups. Some affect only the behavior of individuals, whereas the rest also change their subjective properties. For example, their preferences or desires. This is the distinction between intra and intersubjective relations. If only intra pertains, then market supply and demand can legitimately be conceived as simple additive aggregations of the supplies and demands of the individual subjects. But not so if there exists strong subjective market interdependencies between economic agents influencing the determination of their individual supplies and demands. In the 16th century, Shakespeare wrote, the fashion wears out more apparel than the man. Today, intersubjective market effects are much more extreme and widespread. This is what makes the work of intersubjectivity theorists like Weber and Girard now so relevant. In a high-tech, instant communication consumer society with products increasingly focused on network effects, the notion that economic agents are autonomous subjectivities and that therefore their demands are exclusively intra-subjective appears as a palpable absurdity. Intersubjectivity does not enter directly into the determination of the biological requirements of sustaining a human life and of providing it with basic physical comfort. So, once upon a time, basing the concept of homo economicus on atomistic individualism and sensationalist psychology, although limiting its scope, left economic theory with a large field to cover, but not anymore. Today, the economic realm to which 
equilibrium economics pertains grows smaller and smaller every year. So to conclude, the economics profession faces a moral dilemma. On the one hand, it can pursue for itself prestige, and on the other, it can pursue an understanding of economic phenomena that will be of benefit to humankind. For most intellectual endeavors, the two goals go hand in hand. Not so in economics. If the profession had declined to take the path of upside down science, it is improbable that it would ever have gained the status and accolades that it has come to take for granted. Likewise, if tomorrow the profession were to publicly identify itself not with the showy pseudo-scientific apparatus of equilibrium models, but instead with the real-world task of understanding the reflexive and intersubjective and other difficult-to-understand dimensions of markets, then economics perceived intellectual standing will fall. Can such a radical change of moral heart ever take place in the upside-down science? The Institute for New Economic Thinking and the World Economic Associ Economics Association are, in their different ways, evidence of mounting change in this direction, as well as vehicles for its growth and eventual trial. Thank you. Bravo, bravo. Can we have the slide, please? The same slide with René Girard. There. Thank you. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the human subject is radically incomplete. He desperately needs his fellow man in order to be able to stake out his own identity. Beyond certain thresholds easily attained, his relationship with the world must be described not in terms of needs, but rather in terms of desire. When Rob Johnson introduced us, he used the term wants. I will take it as a, syn uh, a synonym, synonymous with desire. And I will use the term desire because that's a term used by René Girard. Finite needs can be met with finite resources. Desire, or want if you prefer, is a lack that can never be made up for by any finite quantity. The economy is driven by the desire to be recognized by others, to be praised, to be admired, to be sympathized with and loved. And no finite resource will ever be enough to quench that desire. Who said those things? Long before our intellectual hero of tonight, René Girard, proffered them, they were elaborated in the middle of the 18th century by an obscure professor of moral philosophy who lived in Glasgow, Scotland, named Adam Smith. In his treatise, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, 17 years later, he would publish his inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations and become the founding father of economic theory. There is more to it. The incompleteness of the human subject has an impact, an impact on desire itself. We are creatures of desire, but we do not know what to desire. We need the others to tell us. We imitate their desires. We desire the very same objects they desire or already possess. So the form of desire is the triangle. The next uh, slide, please. Jean-Pierre. You got a thing to do. Yeah, but if you cannot control it, okay. Sorry, <laughs> I'm self self sufficient. <laughs> the form of desire is a triangle, subject. three vertices: the subject, the mediator, and the object. Um, the mediator desires or possesses an object. I imitate a mediator, for instance, because, because I admire him, is my model, so I desire the same object. The triangularity of desire explains the obvious but otherwise perplexing, perplexing fact 
that desire may not only cause rivalry, but also depend on it, to the point that without rivalry, desire itself threatens to languish and to peter out. The desire of the mediator creates the value of the object in the first place and calls forth the subject's desire. But then the mediator stands between the subject and the object. The instigator of desire has become automatically, there are no intentions involved here, the major obstacle to the fulfillment of desire. At this point, the subject may, may wish to destroy the obstacle, but if he does so, he destroys the instigator of desire and therefore the value of the object. Desire needs a rival to survive. Rivalry is built into the structure of desire. This is my reading of the theory of moral sentiments written by Adam Smith in the middle of the 18th century. Economic theory has completely forgotten the lesson of its alleged founding father. Other disciplines know better, starting with literature and its omnipresent amorous triangle. Triangles. For instance, in Ulysses, James Joyce has this, his hero, Stephen Dedalus, describe the very same triangle as, I quote, the French triangle. That is, Madame, Monsieur, and the friend of the family. <laughs> Girard's theory rests on this simple truth. Desire is always mediated, always imitated from another's desire. That's why it is called mimetic theory or mimetic theory. Rather than scarcity, the mimetic character of desire is the source of human violence. Economists claim that the model of human action they use is an empty box that can accommodate all kinds of psychology, including the weirdest, sadistic, masochist, neurotic, psychos psychotic, Asperger syndrome, etc., etc. And Freud himself, as we all know, was an economist of sorts. This model, uh, the uh, mainstream economics, is a particular case of what is known in philosophy as the belief-desire model of human agency, which you find in Aristotle, as well as cont in contemporary analytic philosophy of action. Of course, the economists, and that's interesting, do not use the term desire. They use other terms like preferences, of a limity, um, uh, utility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the idea is, is there, and it's the same structure. Well, and this is a very important point. It's possible to show that homo mimeticus, according to this pattern here, is not reducible to the framework of the belief design model. There is a fundamental incompatibility between mimetic design and the belief design model. Let me show you that we have very little time, so I'll do my best. Consider the case that Girard calls double mediation. It is a matter of imitating a design that is itself imitated from another's, from one's own design. I repeat, it is a matter of imitating a design that is itself imitated from one's own design. There is no original desire, and the object on which rival desires converge is the emerging production of the mechanism itself. How does it work? We have ego and alter. Ego and alter imitate each other reciprocally. E ego imitates alter, alter imitates ego. Ego is anxious about alter's desire, which alone can designate a target for his own desire. Some ephemeral and random sign makes him believe that Alter has design on object, designs on object O. So we have the triangle, ego, Alter, object O. Rushing to get there first, ego thereby signals to Alter the stakes of the rivalry. When Alter in turn imitates ego's design, the starting illusion becomes reality. The first to imagine the other's design that seems not to have been imagining at all. He now has the proof. Of course, this is a particularly interesting case of what goes by the name of a self-fulfilling prophecy or self-fulfilling representation. Any object could have emerged from the mechanism. Any object can become the stake of mimetic rivalry. 
History, unfortunately, shows that the most awful wars, think of the First World War, often get started <coughs> through bickering over, over the most insignificant, preposterous, or unlikely object. This is an example, current example, of course, sad one of this. Why is this schema incompatible with the belief design model of human action? The latter presupposes that beliefs and desires taken to be the causes of action are predetermined. That is, that the action they are meant to explain doesn't feed back on them. However, in the case of double mediation, the actions that reveal the converging desires cause them to emerge and to intensify. That is, mimetic rivalry and its object, its stake, determine each other. Neither pre-exists the other. With more time, I would show that a similar feedback loop exists between actions and beliefs, not only desires, but also beliefs. At the end of this short presentation, I will try to show that this structure is very much akin to what George Soros calls reflexivity. My last point is the very important concept of self-transcendence. Think of two absent-minded professors walking together to attend the same event. Neither, neither of them knows the venue, but each one believes that the other knows. A, tra a trajectory emerges endowed with some stability, weak to be sure, but well, it cannot last forever. Sooner or later, someone will ask, are you sure this is the right direction? But I'm following you. Well, no, I've been following you. Okay, but it can last for a while. And it, uh, this trajectory emerges from the fact that each partner follows in the other's footsteps. This is the case of double mediation, of course. Such a trajectory has very interesting properties that can be modeled mathematically with such tools as the Polya's urn scheme, but I'm not going to delve into that, of course, here now. We don't have the time. So I will consider here only the phenomenology of this kind of trajectory. The dynamics converges towards an attractor. That's a general direction of the, of the trajectory, precisely that is generated by the dyna dynamics itself. It is as if the attractor guided the trajectory in the manner of a load star, a north star, if you like, from its transcendent level, but this transcendence is endogenously generated. It is a self-transcendence. Another term in America would be bootstrapping, but it's very fundamentally the same idea. So you ha we have it's everything looks like if the attractor guided the dynamics, but actually the attractor, that is general direction, is a causal product of the dynamics itself, as if the dynamics was capable of bootstrapping itself. This pattern of structure is a conceptual tool, thanks to which Girard may claim with reason that he has solved the problem that haunts the social sciences since the beginning. And this is why Girard is so famous. How is it that in all known non-modern societies, men have referred the social bond to an entity radically exterior to the world of men, namely the sacred? And as far as we are concerned here today, can a science of economy exist if it does not first ponder the major historical coincidence that characterizes the modern world that is the simultaneous retreat of religion and the triumph of market value. Or in other terms, the secularization, disenchantment, desacralization of the world on the one hand and the dominance of the economy on the other. According to Girard, the God-making machine runs on imitation. Namely, here it's no longer the contagiousness of desires, it's a contagiousness of violence itself. What is the sacred, according, according to Girard? It's the violence of men expelled, exteriorized. Violence has the capacity to transcend itself and create the components of what the anthropologists call the sacred. That is, rituals, myths, 
prohibitions and obligations. And thereby, violence has the capacity to control itself through the sacred, to keep itself in check. The sacred uses violence to hold back violence. If I can use a play on words, that is possible in English, in French too. The sacred contains violence. To contain is to have within oneself, but it's also to stem, to keep in check. The sacred contains violence in both senses of the word. This is clear in the case of sacrificial rituals. I'm thinking of uh, human sacrifices. The sacrificial gesture that restores order is one more murder, but it is meant to be the last murder, the last word of violence. That is equally true of the system of prohibitions and obligations. The social structures that unify the community in normal times are the very same ones that tear it apart in times of crisis. Thou shalt not kill. This is a universal prohibition. But when it is violated, there is the obligation to avenge the transgression. The vengeful act purports to obliterate the previous murder, but it is just one more murder added to the previous one. Well, the economy, too, has an ambivalent relation to violence. Two conflicting traditions oppose, oppose each other here. One that runs for, from Marx to the present day critique of capitalism equates the economy with violence. The other tradition, very well analyzed by the historian of economics and economic thinking, Albert Hirschman, the other tradition, the liberal one that goes from Montesquieu to Hume to Hayek, sees in the economy the best remedy for violence. And that's how Europe was built, as you all know by Jean Monnet and others. I mean, in order to prevent France and Germany to fight again, let's create economic ties between them so strong that they will refrain from. You know what happens. So is the economy a cure or rather a poison? In a book that is now 30 years old, Paul de Mouchel and I, we answered, in a secularized society, the economy is, or rather was, I should say today, the continuation of the sacred by entirely other means. Like the sacred, the economy was able to obstruct violence with violence. However, like the sacred before it, and maybe for the same reasons, that's an open question. The economy today is losing its capacity to set limits to violence. In other words, it is losing its capacity for self-transcendence. Such is, in my mind, the meaning of the present crisis. Let me add just two words, although that would require an entire afternoon, uh, about the connections between the logic of self-transcendence, as I've just tried to flesh it out, and the method advocated by George Soros under the name reflexivity. I hope we'll have in the future, near future, the occasion to deepen that connection. From a secular perspective, men make the gods that they believe make them. In Rousseau's political philosophy, although men know that they are the authors of the laws of the city, the laws of the city must have in relation to men the same exteriority as the laws of nature. I could multiply the examples. An entity that is caused by our actions nevertheless acquires a hierarchically superior status to the point that the agents use it as a transcendent guide or lodestar, north star. There is a feedback loop, but it doesn't link entities that are situated on the same logical level. There remains a hierarchy, but this hierarchy is inverted within itself. The generated impacts the generator. The, the effect impacts the cause. The language impacts the meta-language, etc. Self-transcendence implies what Douglas Hofstadter called the tangled hierarchy. Soros, George Soros, illustrates reflexivity with the following example. Quote, financial markets can affect the so-called fundamentals which they are supposed to reflect. There is a, right, uh, a, a hierarchical relation between what is being reflected and the reflection. But in this case, this 
hierarchy is tangled within itself. That is a tangled hierarchy. One last example. I mean, it, I cannot resist the temptation of saying, although I have no time to flesh it out. But I think it's fundamental. In many economic models, as well as in reality, agents are future takers in the same way as they are price takers. They take the future as given, predictions. But although they cause the future by their actions, they take the future as a given that guides their actions. And it seems to me that it is this capacity that I could call the self-transcendence of the future that is in crisis today. Thank you. And so now, Paul Dubouchet. Wow, thank you. It's adjustable, but actually I can't see if I do that. Okay, towards the end of his paper, Jean-Pierre Dupuis said that we, in a common book written more than 30 years ago, argued or suggested that in secularized societies, the economy, or rather, uh, the economy is, or rather was, is what he says, the continuation of the sacred by entirely different means. Let me try to cash out a little with this, this claim and make clear what it means. René Girard, in Violence and the Sacred, argues that the sacred constitutes a mechanism of protection against violence. More precisely, a self-regulating mechanism of violence. Note that the sacred is not exactly the same thing as religion. Religions are particular institutions, like Catholicism, Buddhism, or Islam, which may retain their importance in secularized societies, while the sacred refers to an organizing principle which, in many societies, structures the social organization from basic human relations all the way up to major institutions. In most historical societies, secularized societies are a modern invention, the basic social organization function as a means of protection against violence. Now, do we need a means of protection against violence? Well, apparently we do. According to most political theory, the fundamental role of the state is to protect its citizen against internal and external violence. More importantly, as Jean-Pierre has just reminded us, according to Girard, mimetic desire constitutes an inexhaustible source of conflicts and rivalries, at least as it leads to the convergence of the desires of two or more persons on the same objects which they cannot all possess. Girard's starting point was the recognition that in traditional societies, the danger of internal violence constitutes a fundamental problem and that every social rule or institution contains provision or is essentially organized to prevent or limit internal conflicts. The mimetic analysis of violence provided a hypothesis as to how this state of affair could have come about. Central to this hypothesis is the claim that the sacred is a spontaneous self-regulating mechanism of violence. That is to say, a mechanism of protection against violence that is itself violent. It does not renounce violence, but resorts to violence to protect us against violence. How does it work? Basically, by displacing violence from inside the community where it is most dangerous towards external, dispensable victims and it rests on violence proneness to accede to surrogate victims. Okay, but what does this have to do with economics? At least this. As anthropologists, but also as local businessmen and foreign investors know well, traditional rules of solidarity, which enjoy and join agents to help and to sustain not only direct kin, but also members of external lineages and tribes often constitute major obstacle 
to the success of modern economic ventures, as well as the privileged medium for the development of corruption. Such rules are central elements of the sacred's ability to protect communities against their own violence, to reduce conflict, and to redirect violence towards external enemies. They structure groups as pockets of solidarity, as this example suggests, Destruct as pockets of solidarity, sorry, within which the use of violence is forbidden and among which uh, it is regulated by various rules of, solid, of reciprocity. As this, mod, as this example suggests, establishing modern market economies requires dismantling these structures. <laughs> modern secularized societies have systematically removed these obligations of solidarity. In doing so, they have made possible the rise of modern market economies. Simultaneously, they have brought about an alternative violent form of protection against violence. At first sight, this claim may seem paradoxical. If these rules of solidarity constitute a mean of protection against violence, how can removing them constitute an alternative means of, production, of protection? Doesn't the fact that we could remove them rather suggest that they did not serve any purpose at all? In order to resolve this paradox, it is sufficient to remember that such rules constitutes violent means of protection against violence. Traditional rules of protection of solidarity that require agents to help families and clan members when they are in difficulty force them to take, place, to take part on their side in the conflicts of their brothers, uncles, or cousins to avenge the honor of their sister and to violently respond to violence done to anyone who belongs to their group of solidarity. Thus, the very rules which in normal times protect against violence in times of crisis can become the pathways through which a conflict comes to involve more and more members of the community. Removing them can therefore participate in a new regulation of violence, granted that it is done generally rather than selectively by depriving certain groups or individuals of these protections. However, dismantling these protections, generally abandoning traditional reciprocal obligations of solidarity, had another consequence. It instituted scarcity. Scarcity is usually conceived as the inevitable limitation of resources, what used to be called the parsimony of nature. And economics in this context is understood as the study of alternative means in situations of limited resources. Scarcity also has another definite connotation that goes beyond the simple fact that resources are, by definition, always finite. That connotation is that of a set of goods and resources insufficient to satisfy the needs of all. In traditional societies, where reciprocal obligations of solidarity are still well established, scarcity in this last sense cannot appear otherwise than as the result of a crisis that threatens the whole community. As anthropologists often repeat, in such societies, Nobody is in danger of starving to death unless everybody is. Scarcity in the modern economic sense appears when reciprocal obligations of solidarity began to be generally abandoned. As a consequence, everyone's social world is progressively populated by numerous agents towards whom he or she does not have any particular obligation. Should they, these people, lack anything, the cause of their deprivation is nobody's fault. No one has particular obligation towards them, but it must be, it must come from some abstract general cause, insufficient resources or inefficient distribution. The point is not that such explanation are necessarily false, though they often are, as San Andres' studies of fa on famines cl clearly reveal, but that before, this change happened, such explanations were impossible, not because of the lack of knowledge, but because the world was different. Scarcity institutes a new moral ecology of human relationship, 
one in which we do not have any particular moral obligation towards most of those who surround us. This is illustrated by the prevalence of negative obligations in, moral, in modern moral and political thinking. What this prevalence says is that what happened to others is neither our concern nor our business unless it results directly from some act of our own. Abandoning traditional obligations of solidarity releases agents. It makes them free and allows them to pursue their own interest through economic activity, the goal of which is growth, overcoming scarcity. As Mark Ansbach and André Orléans will argue, the interest of individual, and as Jean-Pierre suggested, is never quite their own, but always reflects mimetic dependence and rivalry, and therefore, at the individual combat level, the combat against scarcity is interminable. At a more general level, scarcity is not, extern is not external. It is not a boundary condition like the parsimony of nature, but corresponds to the under pri underlying principle of déliaison of human relations, which makes modern economic activity possible by instituting a new management of violence, one that allows us to pursue economic activity making, uh, uh, by uh, uh, economic activity and rivalries while reducing their tendency to issue in violent conflicts that threaten the community. Yet this mean of protection against violence, like the sacred, is also violent. Its violence, however, unlike that of the sacred, is not explicit. It does not correspond to public rituals or obligations of retributive violence. Mostly, it is indirect and invisible. What are highly vi visible, however, are its violence consequences in the form of those who are left out. The violence of this means of protection of vi against violence is also revealed in our tendency to blame these victims for their failure to succeed and to limit our obligations to their welfare to the pursuit of the very rivalries that excluded them, arguing that economic growth constitutes the fundamental precondition for bettering their position. Scarcity functions like the sacred, not only because it protects us violently against our violence, but also because, like the sacred, it is the result of human interaction that presents itself like a transcendent constraint that radically limits the choice that are open to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The previous speakers have discussed the, cat the basic categories of self-transcendence and scarcity. It is my turn now to question the fundamental category of economic value. This issue, value, has always occupied a central place in economic thought. Joseph Schumpeter maintained that value must always hold the pivotal position as a shift tool of analysis in any pure theory that works with a rational schema. The dominant theory today, mainstream theory, was the result of a conceptual revolution, the marginalist revolution, bearing on exactly this value. Neoclassical Neo theory state that utility formed the value of commodities, and that utility is the result of a subjective assessment by every agent concerned. In this framework, individual judgment comes first. Accordingly, the market has come to be understood as the place where individual desires come into contact. The force determining the state of the market, uh, say von Mises, are the value judgments of these individuals and their action as directed by these value judgments. There is nothing inhuman or mystical with regard to the market. The market process is entirely a resultant of human actions. 
every market phenomenon can be traced back to definite choices of the member of the market of society. This idea is not peculiar to von Mises. It is shared by most mainstream economists. They believe that the consumer is king because it is the consumer who determines value. It is the consumer who determines the prices of goods as well as the prices of all the factors of production. This belief has received a name, the sovereignty of the consumers. This way of construing value stands in opposition to another view, the view which I advocate and which is widespread in the other social sciences, namely, that value are grounded not in individuals, but in society itself. In this alternative approach, values impose themselves on individuals. They shape the way individuals look at the world. We are therefore faced with two opposite conceptions of value, one corresponding to the bottom-up logic of economics, the other to the top-down logic of the other social science. Let us examine two simple cases that will bring out the limit of the bottom-up approach and the merit of the alternative view. The first example has to do with the desire that consumers feel for durable goods, whether cars or computer or anything else. Does it make sense to reduce those desires or needs to the expression of an idiosyncratic subjectivity? Are they really the choices of a sovereign individual? It seems to me that a good number of these needs or desires are imposed on the individual. By advertising, to be sure, but also by the requirements of our way of life. Think, think of, our, of your life today without a computer. Simil similarly, during a speculative bubble, investors are much more at the mercy of price movements than they are in control of them. Investors are carried away by a collective dynamics that altogether transcends them as individuals. Looking at the 2003-2007 period, for example, one observes a significant increase in the size of the credit default swap market. The gross national value of outstanding CDS contracts has been multiplied by 15. Even though these securities were practically non-existent before the turn of the century, by the end of 2007, their national value had surpassed the stunning figure of 60 trillions of US dollars, making CDS the most widely traded derivative products in the world after interest contracts in only five years. Growth on this scale requires what uh, Emile Durkheim, the father of sociology, called effervescence, effervescence, a kind of collective fervor and mutually self-reinforcing belief that individualistic theory of economic behavior are incapable of accounting for. Something more than the calculation of individual investor is at work here. For it is not investors who are sovereign, but the market itself. On this view, value looks like a power that dominates economic agents and transforms them. And yet, it is also determined by the interaction of these very same agents. How can one make sense of this apparent paradox? Is it possible to give a representation of value as a power that arises from market behavior while at the same time governing this very same behavior? This paradox is the same as the one Dupuis analyzed under the category of self-transcendence. It seems to me that the mimetic hypothesis developed by René Girard provides a firm basis for the formalization of this paradoxical process. Firstly, as we already saw, 
Girard rejects the romantic picture of the sovereign individual, of the person who is the master of his own desires. Desires are imitated from other people's desires. Indeed, the economy may be the place where the mimetic assumption is the more clearly true, for it is obvious that actual economic subjects are, are highly sensitive to the influence of others because they are unsure what it is they want. They are not closed in upon themselves in the manner of homo economicus. However, it is when we consider the interactions between several individuals, all equally mimetic, that the interest of the mimetic assumption is maximal. It is then possible to write mathematical models of what has been described as the mechanism of self-transcendence, a value having the, the power of authority over the individuals, but emerging from their very interaction. Consider, for instance, a financial market in which each investor seeks, seeks to anticipate what the price of a security will be. Keynes famously likened it to a newspaper competition in which readers have to guess which six faces from a hundred photographs most readers would consider the precious, the, the beauty of contest. This is an essentially mimetic dynamic since personal opinion play no role. As Keynes put it, each competitor has to pick not those faces which he himself finds the precious, but those which he thinks like us to catch the fancy of the other competitors, all of whom are looking at the problem from the same point of view. What matters then, the only thing that matters, is the judgment of others. In a study published in the June 94 issue of the American Economic Review, Meta, Starmer, and Sugden show that in such a situation, a majority opinion does in fact emerge when everybody uh, imitates everybody. It turns out that this majority opinion is disconnected with the personal opinion of any of the player. This is a very powerful result. It tells us that when economic agents seek to discover which opinion is most likely to be arrived at by a majority of agents, they are led to concentrate on what Thomas Schelling called focal points or salient opinions, and that there is no reason whatever to suppose that a salient opinion will actually be the same as a personal opinion of any agent. This collective mimetic dynamic illustrates perfectly the top-down logic that is, I believe, characteristic of value. The valuation that emerge in a mimetic group has nothing in common with this or that person's opinion, or even with some aggregate of personal opinions. Instead, it displays a certain autonomy or independence with regard to the entire set of individual judgments having been produced by what may be called a process of self-transcendence, in which the result that is finally arrive, arrive, arrive at corresponds to no one person's evaluation because it is the evaluation of the, of the group as a whole. The mimetic hypothesis, therefore, provides a solid analytical foundation for this novel conception of value. Novel, at least in economic theory. Not only is it consistent with the empirical reality of economic agents who are influenced by each other's behavior, it also permits the collective dynamic that gives rise to self-transcendence to be explored and formally described, while at the same time revealing the primacy of social forces over individual judgments, also in economy. Thank you. Mark. Mark. 
So Andre Orléon has just discussed the role of mimetic desire in determining economic value. And I am going to emphasize the next step, how mimetic desire leads to mimetic rivalry. But first, I want to begin with a quotation about economic exchange. Just as economists have seen scarcity as a fact of nature, so too have they seen economic exchange as rooted in human nature. For Adam Smith, the market is the natural expression of a human propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. This propensity, Smith says, is common to all men and to be found in no other race of animals which seem to know neither this nor any other species of contracts. Not, he hastens to add, that animals are incapable of any kind of coordination. To illustrate the type of concerted action that animals may display before the emergence of economic exchange, Smith gives an example that is remarkably suggestive from a Girardian standpoint. The example concerns two dogs hunting a rabbit or hare. Two greyhounds in running down the same hare have sometimes the appearance of acting in some sort of concert. Each turns the hare towards his companion or endeavors to intercept it when his companion turns it towards himself. This, however, is not the effect of any contract, but of the accidental concurrence of their passions in the same object at that particular time. So what Smith is saying is that greyhounds don't have many ways of showing cooperation with each other. They can't enter into a social contract. They can't engage in peaceful commerce and exchange commodities in the marketplace. But there is one thing they can do. They can join together in chasing down a common victim, an external dispensable victim, to use Paul Dumouchel's phrase. And Smith emphasizes that this happens spontaneously through the accidental concurrence of their passions in the same object. Here, Smith foreshadows the essential insight of René Girard's anthropology. Before the institution of any kind of social contract or economic exchange, there is at least one type of co cooperation that emerges spontaneously, and that, is the, and that is the cooperation produced by the convergence of violence on a common victim or scapegoat. As long as two or more individuals join forces in attacking the same target, they are not attacking each other. The result is a paradoxical form of harmony, a form of harmony founded on violence, but achieved as economically as possible at the expense of a single victim. Girard holds that the convergence of violence on a single victim was a solution to the problem created by the convergence of desires on a single object. When desires converge on the same object, everyone may fight to possess it, putting the survival of the group at risk. The question is why desires would tend to converge on a given object. Is that particular object intrinsically more attractive than other objects? Or could it be that, to borrow Smith's phrase, there is simply an accidental concurrence of passions in the same object at the same time? For Girard, as, as we know, the convergence of desires on the same object is more than a coincidence. It is the result of the propensity of human beings to imitate the desires of those around them. This is Girard's second essential insight. And as we have already heard, 
it contradicts a basic premise of neoclassical economics, the assumption that individual preferences are autonomous. In reality, far from being autonomous, preferences emerge together from an intersubjective nexus where each perpetually influences the other through the kind of reciprocal feedback loop described by Jean-Pierre Dupuy. Girard's approach was anticipated in part by the pioneer of institutional economics, Thurston Veblen. For Veblen, the motive underlying the economy is less a propensity to truck, barter, and exchange than a propensity for emulation. With the exception of the instinct for self-preservation, uh, Veblen says, the propensity for emulation is probably the strongest and most alert and persistent of the economic motives proper. So I am quoting here from Veblen's classic work, The Theory of the Leisure Class, which was first published in 1899. And it is not by chance, I think, that Veblen made these observations at the end of the 19th century. Uh, Edward Fulbrook has identified precisely that historical moment as the time when economic activity in the West stopped being primarily about satisfying material needs. Veblen was writing at the dawn of a new economic age, the age of emulation, when shopping would become a leisure sport, a new arena for channeling human rivalry. What is emulation? It is imitation tinged with rivalry. Emulation means taking someone else as your model and adopting their desire as your own. It means trying to do the same thing they do or to acquire the same goods they have or to achieve the same status they enjoy. One might imagine that imitation of this kind would lead to a static outcome where everyone ends up more or less the same. This is not the case because, as Gerard explains so well, imitation breeds rivalry. If your model is number one and you imitate him, you will want to be number one also. But you cannot be number one without relegating your model to the number two position. Imagine that my neighbor has the nicest car on the block. If I emulate him, I will want to have an even nicer car one that will put my neighbor's car to shame. It will be a great moment for me when he comes home in his faded 2008 Mercedes and sees the gleaming 2013 Mercedes in my driveway. <laughs> Unfortunately, my triumph is apt to be brief. The problem is that my neighbor has the same propensity for emulation that I have in Girardian terms he is just as mimetic as I am. He is likely to imitate me by trying to do to me the same thing I just did to him. In other words, he will try to one-up me as I tried to one-up him. The day may arrive when I come home and see a sporty new Maserati looking down its nose at the rather staid Mercedes in my driveway. Now we're back where we started from, except that both of us have shelled out a lot of money for cars that we probably didn't really need. The only good thing is that through our mutual emulation, we have done our part to boost the fortunes of the auto industry. <laughs> emulation is the high octane fuel that keeps the motors of capitalism running. It is one source of energy that will never be depleted. Luxury cars are just one example of what Fred Hirsch calls positional goods. Positional goods are goods that are valued not just for their intrinsic properties, but for the superior position they are deemed to occupy relative to competing goods. Veblen coined the term conspicuous consumption to describe the competitive display of pecuniary prowess. In a society where conspicuous consumption is a way of life, 
most goods function, at least in part, as positional goods. This has a couple of interesting consequences. First, as Andre Orléon has pointed out in his writings, it means that price no longer plays the role assigned to it by standard economic theory. When price goes up, quantity demand is supposed to go down. But what if a consumer is attracted to a luxury car, a fine wine, or an expensive running shoe precisely because it is a high-priced commodity? If I don't know much about shoes or wine, I will be wary of a brand that is too cheap and prefer a more expensive item. Only an expensive brand can guarantee that I won't lose face by using it. In this case, the relationship between price and demand has been turned upside down. I am interpreting the price as an index to the product's relative value or positional ranking. A high price tells me that other people are willing to pay a great deal for the privilege of owning or consuming the good in question. In other words, that they consider the high price good to be desirable. And if it is desirable to them, then it must be a worthy object for my own desire as well. This is a perfect illustration of what Rene Girard means by mimetic desire. And uh, Andre Orleo has suggested that the upside down relationship between price and demand is also characteristic of financial markets where naive investors tend to interpret a rising price as a sign of desirability, thus contributing to the formation of dangerous bubbles. But the ubiquity of mimetic desire in the economy at large has another important consequence. It means that consumers tend never to be satisfied with what they already have. This is true not just of a few luxury items, but of consumer goods of all kinds. Just as I will not be content to drive a Mercedes once my neighbor has shown off his new Maserati, so the patron of a fast food joint will not be content to eat an ordinary hamburger when he sees the other customers chomping on supersized Whoppers. Nor will any teenager be happy listening to music on last year's iPod when all his friends have this year's model. As Veblen foretold already back in 1899, no level of material production can ever satiate the general desire for wealth insofar as its real basis is the desire of everyone to excel everyone else in the accumulation of goods. But Girard's theory also points to a deeper reason for chronic dissatisfaction. Since mimetic desire is not rooted in anything solid, the pleasures it obtains are bound to be evanescent. When a product is desired not for its intrinsic qualities, but because of the magic aura conferred upon it by the desires of others, it will have a hard time living up to the lofty hopes invested in it. And these hopes are very high indeed when consumers turn to material goods as a way of fulfilling a spiritual need, what Robert Johnson earlier today called an inner lack of wholeheartedness. The proud owner of a new iPod will soon discover that he is not really a happier person than he was before, and he will already be on the lookout for the next, best, the next big thing. The speed of technological innovation must keep pace with the rate of existential disappointment. Of course, many products are genuinely useful. Emulation fuels innovation. Within limits, that is a good thing. As I suggested earlier, mimetic desire is a source of restless energy that will never run out. 
Unfortunately, the same is not true of other resources. Our unrestrained propensity for emulation threatens to ravage the planet. The desire of everyone to surpass everyone else in the accumulation of wealth threatens to leave all of us the poorer. Thank you. Although every one of the speakers respected the time allotted to, to him, we are way behind schedule because we started late. So I don't know who is responsible for the organization. Do we have time for? Do you still have 14 minutes according to this? Sorry? Yeah, OK. So you, you, you understand that we have been working together for 30 years. So we have very little, uh, little to say to each other now. I mean, uh, oh. so all the questions won't be among us, but between you and us. So please, um, who wants to uh, react to what we, we said? OK, um, here, yes. Uh, I want to thank you all for a very profound explanation of Girard's uh, thinking. The area that I have difficulty with is the concept of sacrifice. What is the hard budget constraint for this system of mimet limitless uh, mimetic desire? Yeah. Okay, who wants to? Uh, okay. You know, we had 13, 13 minutes each. When I teach Girard at Stanford, it takes me 12 times three hours, 36 hours, and it's just the beginning. So we had to omit many things in our presentation. Huh? And the concept of sacrifice, which is so fundamental, because sacrifice and sacred, the sacred are very much related. We almost didn't speak about it. Um, but that's a key notion in the Girardian explanation of the emergence of religion two questions huh? there. and human societies. Who wants to address this uh, topic? Mark, maybe? Yeah, I don't yes. know if I understood. I mean, when you say the, the sort of the budget, the economics of it, uh, maybe that's my fault because I made a kind of a, uh, a play on words about it being economical. Um, just to be very clear, Gerard is not recommending sacrifice as a solution, but he is saying that going back to human prehistory, there must have been this problem of violence, of internal violence caused by uh, desires converging on the same objects, not by chance, it could be anything, but simply because even, even if the objects are the same, you know, uh, uh, the French anthropologist Levi Strauss talks about a ritual in France where uh, two people sit down in the same uh, tavern and each one has a, a, a flask of wine in front of him and a glass, and the rule, the etiquette, uh, which you understand very well, um, is that each patron pours the wine into the other person's glass. And Levi-Strauss sees this as a good illustration of the principle of reciprocity that ties people together and helps build society. But I think that it also shows the need to keep objects circulating because there is always the risk that you're, the person in front of you will say, oh, well, maybe he had a little more wine than I did. Or maybe there's just something about it that is better because he has it. So I think there's a constantly this process in human societies to find different ways of keeping sure that objects circulate. Uh, and I think that this, this, when Gerard talks about sacrifice and the convergence of violence on a single victim, it was a first step which then allowed people to um, move on to another step, which in the case of an animal victim is eating the victim together and then initiating positive exchanges, exchanges of invitations, hospitality, and so on. Does that answer at all? The well, yep. yeah. but there are many, sorry, there are many, many hands. Uh, so please, uh, yes, sir. Would you, would you mind introducing our, uh, yourselves when you take the floor, please? Paul Davidson, Journal of Economics, uh, post Keynesian Economics. Edward Fulberg, I think, uh, you're blaming the messenger for the message. Mathematics is just a way of delivering a message. And 
what you don't like is the message, not the messenger. Uh, there's nothing wrong with mathematics. Uh, I agree with you. After all, uh, no. Marshall, Keynes, and so on used functional equations to set up their system. The difference was that they were willing to admit that these functions may not be stable over time and may not create Say's law, whereas uh, you, you, which is what you're objecting to. One of the other uh, persons said that uh, the future was known by the people presently. That's a form of mathematics plus an assumption that you can predict the future. Yeah. Uh, you can still have mathematics that says you cannot predict the future. It's, it's not mathematics per se, it's what you use it for that it seems to me is the problem. And what do you want to respond to this? I have something uh, to say about it, please. Uh, I, I have, no, I have no, nothing in general against mathematics and using it in economics. It was just the particular way they went about uh, applying mathematics to economics, to economic phenomena, rather than, uh, rather than looking for, for mathematics that would describe the structures they work the other way around. And that's, that's my whole point about mathematics. So I have to say something about this, your question. I started being a mathematician, so I know what mathematics are, and I love them, etc. And I think Girard's theory will be taken seriously by economists. It's already taken seriously by many other kinds of people, but by economists, when it, will, when it is formalized and mathematized. But it is already the case to a large extent. I mentioned in passing, when I took the example of double mediation, huh, the two absent-minded professors, what kind of trajectory this is. There is a scheme which is very well known, Polya's earned scheme. Actually, if Mr. Soros were, were here, he would be happy because Soros, uh, sorry, because, because uh, Polya was a Hungarian mathematician, who was a professor of John von Neumann at Stanford. And, um, and um, uh, Polya's urn, it's a, uh, a mathematical tool that allows to formalize this kind of trajectory that is a result of double mediation. Something else, André Orléans here, who is a mathematical eco economist, uh, formalized the following, uh, which is a key, uh, a key insight by Girard. You know, Girard is not a mathematician. Well, he's not a mathematician. He's a, at the beginning, he's a literary theorist. But um, if you have a number of individuals uh, all, imita all imitating each other, and for instance, that can be the imitation of desire or the imitation of violence. Inevitably, under cer cer certain conditions though, all those individual hatreds and the war of all against all will inevitably converge towards a pattern in which all these hatreds will converge to one's, towards one member of the collectivity. Huh? It's a result of the contagiousness of the inter-individual inter licks. Huh? That's a beautiful mathematical result. It's not so. There are many illustrations like that. René Girard's theory can be mathematized. I'm not sure it's absolutely fundamental. Maybe it's fundamental for it to be considered seriously by economists. Huh? That's, it's more a matter of tactics than strategy, I would say. But yes, one should take mathematics seriously. Mathematics is not the culprit. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> Andrew Wong. Um, does this mean that bubbles are inevitable in any system, no matter how many counter-cyclical policy leanings might be created to reduce them? I mean, does the theory have anything to say about you know, whether policy can be meaningfully effective or not? <laughs> André, that's you, that's for you. Yes, uh, excuse me for my English. Uh, yes, I think that there is, uh, there is some kind of uh, very intrinsic, intrinsic, intrinsic instability in financial markets. And, and 
when you, when you write uh, the kind of uh, the dynamics I explain with mimetic agents, you, you can find very different equilibria. It's, it's a very complex system structure. But, uh, but among them, you have that kind, you have very often the, the speculative dynamics. And uh, it's the first reason. Well, it's, it's one possible equilibrium of uh, the, the autoreferential uh, structure. Uh, but there, is, there are other ones. But uh, because uh, you may have a competition between markets, uh, I think that there is an other reason why this kind of equilibrium will, be, uh, will, be, will, will arrive more often. So, yes. Okay, so I'm being asked to wrap up the session. If I can end up with one advice, if what we explain, try to explain to you is of any interest to you, start reading Girard's <laughs> books eh? and, um, and the papers that we submitted to this uh, forum. So thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please join our cocktail reception in the foyer. Our program will resume promptly in one hour with a performance by sand artist Hoi Chu. Thank you.